preach this message entitled, and it'll make sense in just a moment, The Privilege of Serving the God of the Bible. The Privilege of Serving the God of the Bible. This message is about us having a proper perspective concerning our relationship with the Lord. We need to see who we are and where we stand and our importance versus his importance. Amen. This is a message of perspective. It deals with us seeing things the way that they should be seen because some of us serve the Lord like God needs us some of us serve the Lord like we're doing God a favor to be here some of us serve the Lord as though if we didn't no one else would some of us serve him as though if we don't do right he won't be God. And if we do right, he'll be God the more. That's the wrong perspective. You're looking through the wrong set of lenses. Father, bless us now. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. I want to talk to you today about the fact that none of us a fact that none of us can afford to forget. And I really want you to hear me uh, this morning and want you to get this. What I have to say should humble all of us. That's the goal. While at the same time calls us to see how blessed we are to know the Lord. I'm kind of, I'm kind of, kind of somewhat put off or taken aback by um, some of the attitudes that are displayed uh, in our music, in our worship, in our body language, in our demeanor and behavior. I believe that too many believers have forgotten that serving the Lord is a privilege. Jesus said to his disciples, they didn't know this. He said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Every one of us are here today because the Lord made choice of us. While it is true that we chose him on one level, but on an overarching level, he chose us. The Bible says no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Without the Holy Spirit convicting your heart, you can't get saved. You won't want to be saved. You won't even be able to see the worthiness of serving the Lord. Amen. We're blessed today to know him. And the truth that I want you to let sink in is that we cannot harm nor benefit the God of the Bible. Contrary to what may be the popular opinion, we cannot harm nor can we benefit the Lord. He's God. You all are quiet. 
Amen. He's God regardless to what we do and regardless to what we say. Now, it is true that sin grieves the heart of God. Genesis tells us in Genesis 6 and 6, it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. Yes, sin grieves God. Amen. The Bible tells us that we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmity. Amen. And at the same time, where, when, while sin grieves God, obedience moves God. He delights in it. Bible says in Psalm 37 and 23, the steps of a good man are ordered. They are established by the Lord. And he, the Lord, delighteth in his, the good man's way. Obedience delights God. Sin grieves God. But there is nothing that we can do or say to hurt or promote, to harm or help God's status, his character. Amen. The truth is we cannot harm nor benefit the God of the Bible. Our good deeds can't bribe him, and our misdeeds do not threaten him. He's God. Hear me today. God's character is the same whether people obey him or disobey him. God can't change for the better because he's perfect. And God can't change for the worse because he's holy. Amen. He doesn't become greater or bigger or more God because we serve him. He didn't become a great God and a greater God the Sunday that I got saved. Mm -mm. It doesn't affect his status at all. And let me say this, he doesn't become less or smaller or less God because men reject him. Amen. The Bible says of Jesus Christ, in John's gospel chapter one, says he came unto his own and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power. To become the sons of God. He still had that power. Even when he was rejected. And he gave it to those who had sense enough to receive it. Can I get a witness? Second Timothy chapter 2. And uh, verse 11 and down says. Verse 11 through 13 says. It is a faithful saying. For if we be dead, I'm reading from the King James Version, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot. Deny himself. He's not a figment of our imagination. Whether we believe on him or not, the Lord God of the Bible is God. Amen? I want, you, I want to show you something. I'm going to preach after a while. But Romans chapter 3 says something about this. And... Uh, the third chapter of Romans, and we're going to begin reading at the um, third verse. It says, 
What if some did not believe? Shall the unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Verse 4 says, God forbid. Yea, let God be true. And every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Let God be true. The Lord doesn't need the endorsement of Hollywood, of the sports arena, of the LGBTQ and all the rest of the alphabet. He, don't need the, he doesn't need the endorsement of the business mogul, the business community. He doesn't need the endorsement of anyone. He's God. And if there are people who are here today who says, well, uh, preacher, I, I, I don't agree with that. I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe that he's God anyway. Doesn't matter. That's, that's the point. Doesn't matter that you don't believe. Doesn't matter. You'll soon be dead. All of us will be. How many of us have built a world? How many of us hold eternity in our hands? You know what the Lord needs from us? You know what God, the God of the Bible needs from me? The answer is always the same. Nothing. I'm privileged. We're privileged to be in Christ. Our God is so great that he can't fail. The Bible says in Numbers 23 and 19, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should fail. He says, have I not said it? Shall I not perform it? Shall I not bring it to pass, saith the Lord. Isn't that something to think about? We can't help him. And we can't harm him. We can't make him holier. And we can't make him wicked. Amen. We can't bribe him. We can't manipulate him. Praise the Lord. He's God. He's God. And uh, we're not. Say amen. Bible says in uh, uh, Psalms uh, chapter 8. And uh, we're going to move on with this, but I want, want you to see this. Uh, one of my favorite passages, the writer says, O Lord, our God, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings. Look at this. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. That is, out of the mouth of uh, babes and sucklings, praise comes through strength, excuse me, comes through praise. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. Then David says, when I consider thy heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? He says, when I consider the vastness of the created universe, and I consider all that you've done long before you even made us. That you would love us the way that you do. David says, I'm amazed. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? He's a good God. He's a true God and an everlasting king. Job asked the question, the question was asked, it says in Job 7 and verse 17, what is man 
that thou shouldest magnify him. Job asks this question, and that thou shouldest set thine heart on him, and that thou shouldest visit him every morning, and try him every moment. Job says, God, why do you pay us so much attention? Why? Why keep up with us? Why? Why? Uh, what's in it for you that you visit us every morning and that you test us every, look at this, look at this, moment. Every moment. And then he says, how long will thou not depart from me? nor let me alone till I swallow down my spittle. He says, God, why, why don't you look the other way? Why not go and, 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 and visit somebody else? Oh, he was mad. He was off. But the point is, he, he recognizes even in his error, how insignificant we are. And yet God loves us so. That you can't even swallow your own spittle. And God not take note of it. And the Lord not see it. What a mighty God we serve. Mm. In our text. Our text. Our text is in the heat of Job's trial. After, a text comes, after he had been questioned, uh, actually had been condemned by his three friends. Um, with friends like Job had, who needs enemies? And, and the truth is they were pretty good guys. But they were up against, the backdrop was that if misfortune, the belief, that if misfortune happened to any person, it is because of some wickedness in that individual's life. So if things went wrong, if your mama died, you got sick, you lost your fortune, you lost this or that, it had to be because you were wicked. And sinful. There was something wrong with you. And as you know, Job uh, suffered terrible losses. And the beautiful thing about the book of Job is we're allowed to peep into the heavens and see how God works. Uh, it's one of the most fascinating books uh, uh, in the world. Maybe if we do another shut in, we could do the whole book of Job in one setting. But I, I, I might need 12 hours, amen, to do that. And uh, we get, get in about five or six hours of prayer and then begin to study the word of the Lord. Uh, God's proven that it can be done. But Job's three friends, in Job chapter 2, uh, verse 11 says, Now when Job's three friends heard of all the evil that was come upon him, Job lost his wife. Job lost his fortune. Job lost his children. Lost, they were killed. Lost his money. He lost his health. And he lost it all because unbeknownst to him, a conversation took place in heaven. He was drafted by God. The day came when the sons of God met in heaven. They came before the Lord, and the devil came with them. God asked Satan, where you been? He says, I've been walking in the earth to and fro, seeking whom I may devour. And God, on his own volition, on the base of his own godliness, volunteered Job. God said, hast thou not considered my servant Job? Job was not privy to the conversation. Hallelujah. Job's friends were not privy to the conversation. 
God volunteered Job. Now, when you, if you read the first three chapters, you would be under the impression that the God of the Bible unjustly put heavy, undue burdens on a faithful man just to prove a point to the devil and to benefit us as we read the story in the years to come. When nothing can be further from the truth, that is the, that's an improper interpretation. The truth is, God bless you, Brother Williams, the truth is, God knows how. To bring us to repentance. He's the master behind the scenes. Satan's wit when it comes to God is juvenile. He's way behind. This is why you ought to serve the Lord. See, God, God knows what's around the corner. He orchestrates everything. Everything that happened in the book of Job was for Job's benefit. The, the book of Job does not increase the glory of God. The book of Job does not magnify it doesn't make God bigger. It doesn't promote God. It shows that our God, is he transcends everything. That is, he's superior. He rules, and here it is, and he super rules. Praise the Lord. And, and in the book of Job, we learn uh, the devils. We learn Satan's limitations. The devil said to God, I can't touch him. I can't touch him because you put a hedge around him. Praise the Lord. I, there's, no, there's, no, there's no weapon in my arsenal that can penetrate your hedge. The only way I can get to him is you got to remove your hedge. What does that tell you? That the Lord rules and he super rules. Read it on your own, Job. I was getting ready to read it to you, but for, for the sake of time, because I want to read some things to you, uh, you'll see where his, his friends came. Chapter 2, verse 11 through 12, and how when they came and looked down on, on him, Eliphaz and uh, uh, Bildad and um, uh, Zophar they, they came to see him and uh, uh, they made an appointment and they, and they came to mourn with him and to comfort him the Bible says verse 12 and when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not they lifted up their voice and wept and rented everyone his mantle and they put dust on the head that is when they saw him he looked so bad he had gone down he was so sick because Job was a rich man the richest man of his era fed he had everything and it's all gone now and when they saw him all of his clothes were too big sandals fell off of his feet Hair stringy, wife gone, body sick, scraping his skin, the scabs and sores and boils. This is Job. This is Job. And this is why, as believers, you should never in, invite the devil to hit you. Don't, 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 don't do that. Don't, don't, don't tell the devil. Hit me with your best shot. Because when you ask the devil to do that, you're also asking God to remove his hedge. 
And if the Lord remove his head, all, all of a sudden you sit there and you got sores all over your body. Money is gone. Coverage is gone. Health is gone. No, you don't. You want the Lord's protection. Thank you for your protecting hand, Lord. The Bible teaches that they sat there for seven days, sat on the ground seven days and seven nights and just looked at him. They didn't know what to say. They'd never seen anything like that. They were speechless. Some situations in life are beyond what you've been trained for. They looked at him for seven days and, his, and, they, and they saw that his grief was very great. And after seven days, Job speaks. After this, chapter 3, Job opened his mouth and cursed his day. Job spake. And Job spake and said, let the day perish wherein I was born. And the night in which it was said, there is a man child conceived. I hate that I was even conceived that night before even I was born. He says, let that day, my birthday, be darkness. And let not God regard it from above. Neither let the light shine upon it. Let darkness and the shadows of death stain it. And let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. You see, he was in deep depression. He was very sick. He was going through. And his friends just sat there and looked at him. Keep in mind, they were under the thinking of the times. And remember I told you, the, idea, the belief was that if something tragic happened to you, it's because of some wicked sin in your life. So in looking at them, him, in addition to the sympathy that they undoubtedly had, what, what overrode their sympathy was their religious piety. And their self-righteousness. And they began to think and conclude that this man had to have been doing something that was very, very, very wrong. Job got so despondent. Are you praying for me? That not only... Did he lose his wife and his children and his money and his health? But he couldn't find God. And, and he wanted to get in touch with God, but he wanted to get in touch with God for the wrong reasons. Now, let's be fair. You can't help but sympathize with him. Because remember, in my laying the foundation, this wife, when we preach, we want you to pay close attention. Job didn't know about the conversation that had taken place in heaven. Job too believed that if a man uh, suffered these tragedies, he must have done something wrong. And this is why it created such a, uh, a, a, a conflict in him. Because in, in his mind, in his heart, he, he, in, to him, he done no wrong. That deserved this. So in chapter 23, as I move forward, then Job answered and said, even today is my complaint bitter. Choir, his praise was gone. My stork is heavy, heavier than my groaning. That is, his hand is on me and it's deeper than my groanings. In other words, as much as he was groaning, he said, I'm hurt worse than I'm letting on. There are people in here today, you're not as sick as Job was, but you're hurting more than you would let on. Are you with me? 
he said in verse 3, Oh, that I knew where I might, look at the exclamation point, find him. That I might come even to his seat. I wish I knew how to find God. I wish that I could get to his throne. I'd praise him. I'd glorify him. I'd lift him up. No. He said, if I could find him, he says, I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I'd argue with God. I would say to him, if I could find him, how unfair. Where have you been? What is this? Why? Why? Did my wife talk like a foolish woman? Why did my children have to die? What did I do to lose my whole fortune? And, and, as, and, 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 as, and when I thought it couldn't get worse, my health failed. And I hadn't been able to find you either. If I could just find you, I'd argue with you. I would, verse 5 says, I, I, I would know the words which he would answer me. I, I'd argue, and, I'd, and I, I want to wait for his response and understand what he would say to me. Job says, would, will he plead against me with his great power? So if I argue with him, will he just kill me? No, but he would put strength in me. No, he wouldn't kill me, Job says. He would pay attention to what I have to say. There, look at this now, the righteous might dispute with him. That is, then the upright could reason with God. So, so should I be delivered forever from my judge. So if I could just get to him, he wouldn't kill me. If I could get before him, I could explain things. I could reason with him. And it would make all this go away. Now notice what he didn't say. He didn't say if I could get to him, I would ask him, explain to me what you're doing. He said, no, I want to get to him so I can tell him what he needs to do. That's the problem. Too many of us want to instruct God. See, we know what we would tell him. But, but you know what? It may be that the proper response is when you get in his presence, let him explain to you what's going on because he knows more about what's going on with you than you know about what's going on with you. Simon didn't know it. Peter didn't know. Nobody told him but Jesus knew. And I heard Jesus say, Simon, Simon, Satan hath sought and obtained permission to sift you as wheat. But don't worry. I have prayed for you that your faith fail you not. All of this went on, Peter, unbeknownst to you. All oh, the things that happen that's above our pay grade. Above our pay grade. And we think we know when the truth is we don't know. But I thank God. God knows. Somebody just throw your hands up and shout, God knows. God knows. Job said, behold, I go forward, but he's not there. And backwards, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. But thank God. Even in his lowest, in his lowest 
place, in his lowest, at his lowest point, Job still understood one thing. Job said, I, I can't find him. But in verse 10, Job says, but he knoweth the way that I take. That is, I can't find him, but he knows where I am. I'm going to tell you today, God knows where you are. Don't you ever let the devil make you think that God don't know where you are. That the Lord is not aware of your situation. That the Lord is not aware of your address. God knows the way that we take. And I heard him say, and uh, not only that, but when I am tried. With all that he just said, there was still hope in him. When I am tried, when all of this is over, I will come forth as pure gold. Somebody just shout, I'm getting through this. My God today. Yeah, that'll preach, won't it? Yes, sir. Job said, I, I, I want to find him. I need to find him. I can't find him. And then uh, I heard Elihu answer in chapter 33 in verse 6 of the book of Job. Elihu says, Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed out of clay. He said, you wanted to know, you wanted to find him, you wanted to talk to him, you wanted to be able to explain, you need somebody to talk to you. Here I am. He said, God heard your prayer. I am here to talk to you. Now the question is, who is this Elihu? Who is this young man whose name means he is my God. Who is this brother, a man, whom theologians uh, say that he was a type for Christ in that uh, Elihu was a mediator between God and Job. And Jesus, according to 1 Timothy 2 and 5, is the mediator between God and man. The Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Yes, my sister, you did right to leave Islam because you came into the religion where the one mediator between God and man is the man, Christ Jesus. It was not Muhammad. Muhammad came Way too late. God's mediator. The, the, the man who stands between uh, us and God is Jesus Christ. The savior of the whole wide world. And not only that, but he is the mercy seat. He is the propitiation for our sins. Can I get a witness? I feel, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm about to feel like preaching. You're going to make me take off in just a minute. Let me give you the identity of Elihu and, and I'm going home, amen, and get a little balance in. The married couples understand that. Bible says, so verse 32, chapter 32, verse 1 says, so these three men ceased to answer Job because he, look at this, because he was righteous in his own eyes. Now, that's one thing Job held to. So Job's position was, everything that's happened to me is not fair. See, we, 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 we preach things that we don't know the meaning of. We, we get happy and say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Job did say that, but Job was accusing God of being unfair. Right. For Job said, you're killing me for no reason, but I'm going to trust you. So actually, Job presents himself as being much more nobler, much more noble than the Lord is. The Lord is being ignoble. He's slaying me. But yeah, even though he's killing me for no reason, I'm going to trust in him anyway. That's not good. That's not good. It's amazing what happens when you know the context. So he says, uh, his sons, these men, they stopped talking because Job was righteous 
in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Berichel, the Buzite. As a matter of fact, he was a distant relative. He was a, he was a relative of Abraham. Uh-huh. Of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was Elihu's wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. So when people said Job didn't sin, that's what the Bible says about Job in verse 1, chapter 1. It says, all in all this Job sinned not. Up to that time, but old Job did sin. Remember, I'm telling you, what the book of Job shows you how God works behind the scenes to deliver. See, so Job, uh, Elihu was angry because Job justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they found no answer and yet had condemned Job. I told you with friends like him, he is who needs enemy. They couldn't figure it out but they condemned the man. Now Elihu waited till Job had finished, had spoken because uh, they were elder than he. Thank God. He understood that older men are talking and a wise young man asks to be invited in. You don't just jump in like we're all the same age. So the older men, even though they didn't have the answer, he understood you, you got to wait. See, now we're, we're in a day now where uh, uh, somebody young enough to be your child would talk to you like you're on the same level. He waited until they finished. When Elihu saw that there was no answer, I'm preaching, in the mouth of these three men, then was his wrath kindled. You know, I like Elihu because I'm glad. That, 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 that he got, no, it, keep saying, it kept saying his wrath was kindled. See, some of us don't get upset at ignorance, but you should, especially when people don't know what they should know. There are certain things you ought to know. A preacher ought to know certain things. A teacher of the gospel ought to know certain things. A parent ought to know certain things. A, a worker ought to know certain things. A dad ought to know certain things. A mom ought to know certain things. And when you don't know things you should know, then that should upset someone who knows that you should know. told my son one day I was talking to him I said son my anger my wrath is not because I do not have lofty plans for you and thoughts of you but it's because I do if I didn't thank you for anything if I didn't think there was much to you if I thought you was a bad seed if I thought you were just a loser you don't get angry with losers because losers lose. You don't, you don't get angry with people who don't got it because if you don't got it, you don't got it. But when someone has it and they fail to live up to it, if you are a good teacher, a good pastor, a good parent, then it, it causes rage and anger to rise up in you. Mm, I'm going to preach in just a minute here. Bible says his wrath was kindled and Elihu the son of Barachel uh, the, the Buzite answered and said I am young and you are very old. Wherefore I was afraid and thus not show you my opinion. This guy was brilliant. I said Days should speak. The multitude of years should teach wisdom. He said, should. There's no fool like an old one. Praise the Lord, should. That's why if you, as you grow, you want to grow wiser. Don't grow dumber, grow wiser. 
Come on, guys. Come on, husbands. Come on, wives. Come on. Come on, moms. Come on, dad. Let's catch on. Why are we still making childish mistakes? Why would a man who's no longer a teenager want, why do you want to talk like a teenager? Walk like a teenager. Dress like a teenager. Act like a teenager. You're not a teenager. Praise the Lord. I'm not a teenager and don't want to be one. I love being where I am. And I, hey, I don't dread aging because there ain't but one way to stop it. And it ain't no cream you can buy at the store either. It's an age-defying cream. That's a lie. Nothing defies age. The only thing that can stop aging is death. And I want to live, don't you? This man said, oh, he was somebody. He said, I want to give my opinion. Uh, uh, days should speak. How am I doing? Y'all follow me? Y'all give me a few more minutes to preach this. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm going to try to go fast. He says, but there is a spirit in man. The breath, the inspiration of the Almighty giveth him understanding. See, wisdom comes from God. Old men and young men alike may lack wisdom, but if, but if you connect yourself to God, young or old, God can give you wisdom. I know of young men who have, they are precocious, they have the wisdom of of men who are much older. God does that. And this man had that wisdom and he waited his turn. And he said something that's powerful. He said, great men are not always wise. Neither do aged understand judgment. Therefore, I said, hearken to me. And I will show you, he says this word, for a second time, my opinion. Since y'all gave yours, so listen to me, I, I'll give you mine. Behold, I waited for your words. I waited to hear your conclusions. I didn't, inter I didn't interrupt. I didn't talk over you. I respected you. I, I, I stayed in my place. I st stood over there and, and let you talk. That's See, right. that's the way you're supposed to do that. Right. See, wait your turn. It's amazing that I can't get an amen on that. <laughs> See, respect and order is a powerful thing. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised at how you are heard if you wait to be heard. You'd be surprised at how much weight your words carry if you know how to respect those to whom you're talking. See, because you, you, can, you can be right all day long, but, but if, if the, 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 the ranking authority who, who, who has the power to do this or that don't hear you, then you won't prevail. So you got to know, you got to know decorum. That's a whole lot the Bible teach. Strategy. You can't bust up in the boss office talking like y'all equal. You're getting ready to get fired. You may be right, but you're going to still get fired. Amen. Truman said of the great uh, general uh, uh, Patton, he was a great general, but he forgot, a great warrior, but he forgot who his boss is. And Truman fired him because he called uh, the Truman a liar. He said, oh, no, you forgot. You, look, I'm the president. Look how famous you are. He forgot that decorum. This is good preaching. And streamers, learn this too. It helps everybody. Kids, adults, learn it. Regardless of, and this is, this, is, this is transferable. Take this to work tomorrow. Take this home with you in your marriage. Apply this when dealing with your friends and acquaintances. Respect goes a long way. This, this young man, he had the answer. He says, great men, I got to, I got to move on, are not always wise and neither do, uh, do age. Do the age understand judgment? He says, therefore, I listened to your conclusions, verse, verse 11. I waited for your conclusions. I gave ear to your reasons while you searched out what to say. Yea, I attended you unto you. See, I served you. And I listened. And behold, there was none of you that convinced Job. Or that answered his word. 
lest you should say we have found out wisdom. God thrust him down, not man. He says, don't you even dare say we figured it out. And it was God who did it and not man. Because the truth is, you guys never gave the right answer. Now he have not, now he hath not directed his words against me. That is, he says, Job never asks me my opinion. Neither will I answer him with your speech. I won't use your arguments. I like this guy. Uh, look at this. They were, they were amazed. They answered no more. They left off speaking. See, when Elihu started talking, they were stunned at his approach and his wisdom. When I had waited, for they spake not, but stood still and answered no more, I said, I will answer also my part. That is, I will show my opinion. He says, I waited until all had finished. They were through. No one else had anything to say. And the next thing you know, check me out, saints. Look up for a minute. Next thing you know, you see this. Y'all, can I say something? My, my name is Elihu, and, and I've, I've been listening to this, and, uh, and, and uh, I just stayed over and kept my mouth shut. Can, can I weigh in? Can I say something? Oh, my. And, and, he, and he, he says to him in verse 21, he says, and when I talk to y'all, do, do you not mind if uh, I, I don't use any flattering titles? I, verse 22, I, I don't want to, I, I need to be able to talk to you. I need to be able to respectfully say what needs to be said. I need to tell y'all something. They said, all right, say on. Chapter 33, I feel my help. Are y'all getting bored? He said here, I know, I know that fried chicken, you can smell it, can't you? He said here, he said in, uh, he says to Job, verse, chapter 33, uh, verse um, 6, I'm skip around, he says, Behold, I am according to, remember I read this, to your wishes in God's stead. I also am formed out of clay. Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid, neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee. That is, he's saying, I'm not going to be some mystic. I'm not going to tell you, God said this and God said that. And oh, there's no, there's no uh, mysterious superpower going on here. He said, oh, no, none of that garbage. He says, uh, verse 8, Surely thou hast spoken in my hearing. I heard you, Job. I have heard thy voice. The voice of thy words saying, you, Your argument have been, I am clean without transgressions. I am innocent. Neither is there iniquity in me. I done no wrong. I've heard you say, I don't deserve any of this. I've heard you say, God has done me wrong. You said, I heard you, you said, behold, he findeth occasion against me. You, you accuse God of being nitpicky. You said, God, look for something. To get me with. He, he cometh. He, he counteth me for his enemy. Yeah, somebody said Job didn't sin. He, he says God mistreated me. He treated me like I was his enemy. When I was faithful to him. He said he putteth my feet in stocks. He maketh all my paths. He marketh all my path. Look at, uh, look at Elihu. He says, Behold, in this thou art not just. You wasn't right, Job. See, because nowhere in there did he say that Job asked God what's going on. He just accused the Lord of doing him wrong. See, everything, everything is not as it appears. Some of us, before we get an understanding, we get funny. Oh, they overlooked me. No, 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 no. Sometimes it's not that you overlook. So all things are not as they appear. 
This is why the Bible says, with all that getting, get in understanding. What's wrong with sister so-and-so? What's wrong with brother so-and-so? And we, what's wrong with them? And we'll ask everybody what's wrong with them but them. When they should be the first person you ask. And if they tell you nothing's wrong, believe them and go on about your business. Everything is not the way it appears. So now, Job says, uh, Elihu says, you're not right in this, Job. You're not right. Look at this. Behold, thou art not just. He says, I will answer thee that God is greater than man. What was he saying here? God is too wonderful. God is too holy. God is too righteous. God is too marvelous to chasten a man for nothing. To beat a man down and be nitpicky. God doesn't do that. That's what humans do. That, 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 that's what man does to man. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, you fall out with a guy. You fall out with somebody. They can find everything wrong with you. All of a sudden, now you blink your eyes too many times. So that's what, that's what man does. He says, but God is greater than man. And that's one of the things that I don't like about modern music, that I don't like about modern preaching, and I don't like about the modern church because people try to bring God down on man's level when God is greater than man. Ain't nobody like the God of the Bible. He's greater, can I get a witness, than man. He says, why dost thou strive against him? For he giveth, uh, look at this, for he giveth not account of any of his matters. This stuff is so good. I, got to, I feel you. I feel me. I'm losing your attention. Oh, you don't like this now. He said, well, hey, 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 isn't he through yet? But let me just, uh, yeah, it says, mm. he says, why dost thou strive against him? For he giveth not an account uh, of any of his matters. That is, he doesn't owe any of us any explanations. I haven't asked you to say anything to your neighbor, but look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God doesn't owe you an explanation. Not even concerning your own life. Not even concerning why your mama died. Not even concerning why he spared someone else's. Not even concerning the sickness that's in your body. He doesn't owe you an explanation. I didn't say he wouldn't give you one, but he doesn't owe you. And I'll tell you when you won't get one. When you approach him like he owes you. Now if you come humble and act like you got some sense, you might get something from God. But you roll up on God like God owes you something. You get nothing from the law. That's why some of you can't feel anything. You, ain't, you don't have any power. You don't have any joy because your, your perspective. I'm talking about perspective. You don't see him right. You think that you're the star. You think that you're the catch. We're not the catch. He is the catch. He's the star. Matter of fact, he's the bright and morning star. God, if you don't ever explain to me, if you don't ever answer on this side some of the questions I had, why didn't my dad leave? Why didn't him and my mama make it? Why didn't me, Tom, Gabriel, and Heath have to struggle through certain things? Why Leela? Why this? Why that? Yeah. I look at my father's picture every day and I studied, I marvel. I hate that I didn't get to know him. Why? But when I ask God, I can't clench my fists and ask him. I can't roll my eyes. I can't approach him with a spirit of entitlement. Mm -mm. For he owes me no explanation. Oh, I feel my help. God Almighty, he says here, even though he doesn't owe us any explanation. Look, 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 look at what, what Job said. This, this Elihu, this Elihu's a bad boy. Elihu says, God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, 
in slumbering upon the bed. Then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instructions. Good God Almighty. He says, even though he doesn't offer uh, owe us an explanation, the truth is, he does explain. He speaks. God speaks once. God speaks twice. That is, he speaks to us more than one time. Good to see y'all. More than once, he tells you. But you know what? It ain't that, uh, Keisha, that God don't talk. It's that we don't listen. He says, I come to you in dreams. He says, I speak to you in visions. I, I, I reveal things to you. But you, Job, didn't get it. God, God has spoken, but you see, we're so busy murmuring and complaining that we don't hear God when he comes in the form of a still, small voice. I got to get out of here now. He says... Ah, look what he does. I got you, you want me to preach this. He says that he may, he speaks, and, and, and verse 16 says uh, that he may, look at this, withdraw man. I love you, Jesus. I feel, I feel that crying. That he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man and keep back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the soul. He said, yes, I do things. I let tragedies happen. And uh, the reason I do it, I reveal it to you, but many times you're not listening. But the, the point is, the reason I do these things is I, I, I buffet you to turn you from your purpose. See, because you are a hard-head Negro, and you are about to mess up your life. I have a plan for you. So I let something over here happen to turn you from your purpose, to send you back another way because if you keep doing what you are doing, you are going to destroy yourself. So I send a catastrophe over there and an accident over here and I let something else happen over there just to save you. He's the mighty orchestrator who works behind the scenes. See, we think we got God figured out. You don't have the Lord figured out. Mm. We, hey man, you better leave that alone. You better leave that alone. We were talking about that and, and started crying yesterday. Where's McNeil? And me, McNeil, and uh, oh, Pastor Parker. We, you know what we started talking about? We started talking about how God's ways are past finding out. When, when you finally arrive at finding out, you still got to keep going. Because God's ways are past finding out. What a mighty God we serve. And look at this now. He says, he does these things. And look at verse 29. I'll move forward. Verse 29 said, Lo! All these things worketh God often with man to turn back his soul from the pit to delight with the light of the living. It could be Tom that the answer uh, is that it would have been the worst thing in the world for us to come up in the, atm in the uh, atmosphere that we thought would have been ideal. It could, it could be that God looked down and saw that in this case, I need to let one woman raise four boys because the influence of those men may have been the worst things in the world. It could be, saints, could it be that the things that have happened to you that have made you upset, if God actually let them happen to bless your life and to bring you to the place where you are right now. For I heard David say, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Time won't let me preach and show you in chapter 34 where God, Job, proves that everything that happens in life that God, hallelujah, gives us what we deserve, except when he gives us mercy. His mercy lifts us from the pit. He showed Job where Job was wrong. In chapter 34, verse 5, he said, For Job have said, I am righteous, and God have taken away my judgment. 
Should I lie against my right? My wound is incurable without transgressions. Look at Job saying, what man is like Job? He said, look at me. He says, I drink up scorn like water, which, uh, which goeth, in, goeth in company with the workers of iniquity and walk with wicked men. Job said, I'm a good man. I can take scorn. I can be around wicked folk. And I don't even fall for their wickedness. He said, for he hath said, uh, it profiteth a man nothing that he should delight himself in God. Job said, he read it wrong. And he came to the conclusion that there is no profit in serving God. Now I know that's a lie. And you know that that's a lie. But you know yourself, you can go through. And sometimes when you do the right thing everything goes wrong and then here come that same spirit trying to whisper in your ear and said look at what happened you paid your tithe you gave your offering you did what was right and trouble broke out anyhow seemed like doing right won't pay off but I'm here to tell you that if you do right God will bless you you see sometimes the test is yours to see if you are hanging there and do the right thing and be holy until God delivers you it's the trick of the devil to try to make us fall out with God and then begin to see the thing the wrong way and then begin to act as though if we don't do right that that will somehow it will somehow lessen God that it will somehow make God weaker but I want to tell you that if I stop preaching today God will raise up another preacher tomorrow I want to tell you I got that wrong God won't raise up another preacher tomorrow if I start preaching today if I stop preaching today God will raise up another preacher today he don't have to wait 24 hours because he is God hallelujah I didn't make him God we don't make him great we don't make him wonderful he's wonderful all by himself he's wonderful when we are right and he's wonderful when we are wrong he's God when we're right and he's God when we're wrong he's God when we believe he's God when we don't so what is the point of this the point is that when we serve him we serve ourselves because we're not great without God but God is great without us we're not saved without Jesus but Jesus is saved without us we're not holy without the Lord but he's holy without us any way you look at it if you're saved you're the big winner somebody lift your hands and praise God for bringing you out praise the Lord for setting your soul free I'm glad that I'm in the house of God that I'm sanctified and in the holiness church you talking about balance I'm glad that he rescued me from my sins what did I have that he needed I had nothing I had nothing the Bible says all things come from thee O Lord and of thine own have we given thee when we give him an offering it's already his when we give him praises they praise him all the time when we lift his name up it's already lifted up I heard Isaiah say in the year King Uzziah died I also saw the Lord where was God God wasn't down God wasn't depressed but he was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and the whole world was filled with the glory of God oh, oh, somebody give him praise 
praise him for being saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah! I want you to do this, and I'm done. I want you to praise him like, it's, like you realize that you're privileged to praise the Lord. Woo! That's right! That's right! That's right! Praise him! Praise him! Your praise won't make him better, but your praise will make you better. Your praise won't make him stronger, but your praise will make you stronger. You've been appreciative for being born again. Won't make him any more God, but it will give us power. It will give us joy. It will. It will make our lives better. Woo! When Elihu finished, when Elihu finished, Job was a different man. Then God came back to him. Said, now you've been wanting to ask me questions, and I'm done. And God says, I have a question to ask you and I want you to gird up the loins of your mind. When I laid the foundations of the world, where were you? See, you, you're coming before me like you have weight, like you have authority. Sit down, boy. Sit down. Get on your knees. You can ask me the same questions, but rephrase it. Rephrase it. How do you rephrase it? Here's how you rephrase it. You rephrase it this way. You're going through, right? Life's been hard. He says, he says here's how you rephrase it. You can say everything you want to say, but just rephrase it. How do you rephrase it? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. I didn't got around to it yet. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, now I'm finally, finally, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. How about shake our apples? From all evil. For, see, stay in your place. For thine. See, I don't want those lips stuck out. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. See, you got to know how to rephrase it. You got to know how to approach the living God. Approach him recognizing that we're privileged. It is a privilege to be able to approach him. Somebody got some things that they want to approach God with today. Somebody's perspective have changed. I hope yours have. Hope you see that the big winners is us. We come with nothing. He gives us everything. We come empty-handed. Well, I, had a, I, I, I wasn't empty-handed myself, Pastor. I had some talents. He gave you them. Well, I, I had some abilities. He gave you them. Oh, no, we, we're empty. We're empty. We're empty. And, and we empty people, many of us, treat the Lord as though we have bargaining power, that we can bargain with God. You can't do it. You can't do it. The windows of heaven are open. 
Glory to God. Come to the altar if you want something from God. Because we're going to rephrase it. The windows of heaven. The window of heaven is open. The fire is falling tonight. Joy, joy, joy in my soul. Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old filthy garments. He gave me a robe pure and white. Oh, yeah. Now I'm feasting. On manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. Oh, that's why I'm happy tonight. We're getting ready to pray. That's why I'm happy tonight. Oh, Lord, joy, joy, joy in my soul. Jesus made everything all right. Oh, I gave him my whole filthy garment. Thank you now. He gave me a robe, pure and white. Oh, yeah. Now I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy tonight. Lift your hands. We come before you, Lord. To kind of rephrase some things. First of all, we come to acknowledge your name and your greatness, your awesomeness. My Lord, we come in full assurance, and we mean it, Lord, that we're amazed that you'd even be mindful of us. Who is man that thou art mindful of him? We come before you, Lord. We come before you. We empty out tonight. We empty out this morning. We come not in a spirit of entitlement, but we come as seekers. You said, seek me, and you'll find me when you search for me. With all your heart. We, we come seeking, Lord. Seeking. We, we dare not even lift our heads up. We come seeking. We dare not even make any demands. We come seeking. We won't let, I won't take, a, take no for an answer come out of our mouth. We come seeking. Because we know that you do not owe us any explanation. We come seeking. Yet knowing that you are a good God. And you'll visit us in our dreams. You'll speak through the preacher. Somebody's got the answer today in the word. Somebody has a greater understanding of how you work. Just through the preached word of God. We come before you right now in the name of Jesus. And we ask you, oh God, great one, God whom our obedience cannot help. And God whom our disobedience cannot threaten. God whom we have nothing to bargain with. God who is so great that he cannot change. We cannot do anything to improve you because you're perfect. We cannot do anything to make you sin or make you less because you're holy. Yes, you, God of the Bible, we come before you. And we bring our Petition. Lay it at his feet right now. Tell him what you want. 
Tell him what you want. Talk to him. Tell him who you are. Tell him. And, and when you tell him, tell him like you know he already knows. We've been convinced of scripture that he knows. And, and, and as you're talking to him, this is a unique prayer line. As you're talking to him, just know now. You, you want his will to be done. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Because see, when God was finished, Job was righteous. When God got started, Job was not. When God was finished, Job was righteous. When God started, Job was not. He was self-righteous when God started. But when God finished, he was righteous. Glory to God. Lord, Lord, do it, do it, Lord. Lord, whatever you need to do, whatever, yeah, that's right, tell him, whatever you need to do to bring me to where I should be. I trust you, Lord. Oh, my God, what a different prayer. What a different kind of prayer. But we're humbling ourselves. We're humbling ourselves. We take that edge off, Lord. God, we take that bass out of our voice when we speak to you. You're our Savior. You're the Mighty One. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We glorify you. We give you all the glory. We give you all of the praise. And Father, we see ourselves in comparison to you as nothing. We thank you, Lord, that our righteousness can affect each other. And our wickedness can affect each other. So God, give us to be righteous. And give us to be holy so that we will not uh, hurt one another and ourselves in our own sin. For nothing brings you down. No one can dethrone you. You are God. I feel the Holy Spirit. Now those health situations. May the Lord heal you. You're in a place now where you can be healed because you realize that he don't have to heal you. But he'll do it because he loves you so. He'll do it because you want him to. And you will accept it if he tells you, I think it's best that I leave you afflicted. I think it's better for you that I not deliver you from this affliction. Glory to God. So the outcome, you're going to trust him with it. Right now, I want somebody to tell the Lord God of the Bible. I want somebody to tell the Lord God of the Bible, Lord Jesus, whatever you do, I'm staying with you. Lord Jesus, whatever decision you made, I do not serve you with ultimatums. You can count on me. Give him praises right now. I went to one of, during the women's con 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 convention, I went to one of the most powerful leaders in our church. And I went to him with a concern. And I got audience with him, one of the most powerful men in our church. And I, and I, I talked to him about what was on my mind. But I said to him as I talked to him, I said, now sir, you need to understand one thing in my talk. I have not come to you with an ultimatum. My position is not do what I want or I'm gone. I said, sir, I'm in this church. And even if the ruling don't go in my favor, I'm going to serve the Lord and I'm going to serve my church. That was in the women's convention. While at the AIM conference this past week, how about this? He called me and said, I want you to come preach my convocation. See, it's amazing what happens when you humble yourself. See, now automatically now God is setting things, he's setting things in order to make things work out. Ain't had to fight no battle, ain't had to do anything, but just, is that what you got? To, you got to learn that your biggest fight takes place on your knees. You got to learn how to just humble yourself. Ah! I'm gonna let you go back to your seat. We're going home. But will somebody just bow down before the Lord? Just humble yourself. Just humble. Woo!